kind of Essie's idea that she brought to me because she gets so many people um, at her talks just asking how they can get into what she does. So we brought in Margie, who is an expert in book publishing, and then Catherine Lopez, who hopefully will join us very shortly um, to talk about writing, but Essie is also, she can also discuss the writing aspect um, if Catherine is able to make it. So I'm going to let Essie just kind of take over, and, uh, and she'll explain how it's all going to work. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. I know there's a lot of stuff to do at CPAC, and I appreciate you decided to spend some time with us here today. Um, like Alyssa said, yeah. the idea for this came from you guys. I go to colleges, as do Margie and Catherine, um, speaking to conservative groups, and I always get a lot of questions. How do I become a public? How do I get on TV? How do I go into radio? How do I get a column? How do I write a book? And uh, regardless of the topic that I'm speaking on, that's a big question you all have. Um, the industry is notoriously close-mouthed, protective, proprietary, and competitive. So it's not often that you meet people who want to share advice. I find that appalling because I am only marginally successful because of the great advice and generosity of the people I've met along the way. And I'm happy to share that advice, tricks of the trade, tips with you all. And I want to thank Margie and Catherine, who I know, um, are also so generous to spend some time with you guys and tell them what, tell you what they know, which is everything. So um, keep in mind, as you embark on this adventure of a career, you won't always find people who are willing to help you out. Um, so really lucky that you have some people here today that want to um, give you advice. So basically, I'm going to run through my quick story, how I did it, and then Margie's going to talk about publishing and her story. If Catherine makes it, she's going to talk about short-form journalism, right? and then we're going to break into groups. And each of you will have a chance to meet with each of us. Workshop your stuff if you brought it. If not, ask us questions, and we'll talk about um, the industry and give you all our deepest, darkest secrets. Um, I came rather accidentally to this. Uh, I had no political experience in college, and in fact, no communication, journalism background. I studied art history. Super useless. Um, Fun, but totally useless. What I did do in college was work at the paper. And so I got sort of, you know, on the ground, real world experience that was invaluable. Um, but that was really my only preparation for this. Um, I moved to New York, took some writing jobs, very, very glamorous ones. And uh, around 2004, convention came to New York that year. It was a really political time. I was a young conservative living in New York. and. My friend and I decided, let's write a book. We wrote a book called Why Wrong About the Right, defending young conservatives against liberal stereotypes. It took us about eight months to get this book shopped. Uh, if you don't know, the book publishing industry is incredibly liberal as well. It's a gift to all of you. Um, <laughs> It's not just hard to get a publisher, it's really hard first to get a literary agent. I know Margie could probably tell you more than I can, but my experience was it took us about a year to get a literary agent who was willing to work with two no-name young conservatives. And the feedback we got was not just, you know, thank you, no. It was hostile. It was, um, I hope you never get work in this town. I hope you're swimming in the blood of your children. I mean, just weird, crazy, hostile <laughs> stuff. Um, but anyway, we finally landed a great agent who put us with another great publisher. Um, and sold the book in two weeks, which was great, which was our luck. From there, the publisher wanted, of course, us to promote the book, so booked us on some TV shows and some radio outlets. If you don't know this already, radio sells books. It's not really TV. It's a lot and a lot of radio. So I would do 20 radio hits a day on the phone, just boom, 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 boom. Um, doing that, if you're good, show up prepared, you're nice to hair and makeup and the crew, um, people want to have you back. So they'd call and say, can you come in and talk about this? Sure. Can you come in and talk about that? Sure. The trick is, when you're a generalist like me, 
Um, you got to convince people that you're still relevant when this new story is gone. So from this new story to the next, I will always have something to say about whatever people are talking about. That's the job. So I started doing that more and more and more. People started calling for more appearances. Happy to. I chopped a lot of my wood. I prefer to be glitter bombed, but okay. Um, you know, the TV and radio for me is fun and fine and promotes the right the, the writing, but the writing is really where I live. So I shot columns around, worked my ass off to um, get published. I did turn those columns into other column experiences and opportunities and, you know, finally have my own column in a great newspaper. I do some editing work for Town Hall and other publications. Um, in my experience, there are three ways to become a pundit. And Margie can talk about the books and Catherine can talk about print if she comes. Um, these are not hard and fast rules, but this has been my experience. One, write a book. That's what I do. For whatever reason, writing books are still looked at um, with real credibility and legitimacy. I think people realize it's really hard to write a book. It's hard to sit down and write 300 pages. It's hard to do it more than once. And it's hard to do it in, in a saleable way. So even if nobody reads it, but your mother, if you've written a book, it's a great way to introduce yourself into the world of punditry, regardless of what the topic is. You got a book, producers need guests, producers need topics. They're happy to talk about yours when they have nothing else going on. Um, two, become an expert in something. Go out into the field and become the terrorism expert. Go out in the field and become the, you know, um, Somalia expert. I remember, in fact, when the Somali pirate story was bubbling up like five years ago, four years ago, I was at Fox and the producers were scrambling, like, we need a pirate guy. Who knows pirates? <laughs> we were making calls and finally we found a maritime terrorism expert who became the pirate guy on that story for, you know, two weeks. The problem with this, of course, is you're not going to be called to talk about every story. You're going to be called to talk about that story and only when it comes up. That's very convenient if you don't want to have to stretch and think about seven million things, um, but inconvenient if you want to be on television all the time. Um, in my case, as a generalist, of course, I have to talk about everything. So I'll get calls about, you know, Wiener Gate and Snooky to you know, NAFTA, terrorism, the economy, the election, of course. And you kind of got to be ready to do it all. Um, and if there's stuff you're not willing to talk about, I won't lie, that's going to make the job a little harder. Um, because people want a seven-trick pony. They want someone who can come in, write, read, speak, and kind of knows a little about everything. So it's a constant, you know, I'm watching the news all day long, reading online, print, everything, just so I know a little, I know I have no depth of knowledge on anything, but I know a little about a lot of things. Anyway, the third way to become a pundit is to spend five years working for no pay at a really small town newspaper, after which you spend five years working for no pay at a medium-sized newspaper, and then you spend five years working for no pay. Hey! Come on Hi! Yay! Sorry. I was under the impression we started at two and didn't realize the Occupy. Uh, I was going to say, did you get occupied? I got <laughs> did you get uh, uh, occupied? I wanted to put that as a quote somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping that was an awesome story. Not answering. No, no awesome story. Just put that okay. In. <laughs> um, anyway, spent a lot of time working in newspapers for no pay, and maybe, just maybe, in 15 or 20 years' time, they will award you. Uh, your own column. It's uh, the hardest way to get into this business. Um, and maybe if you get your own column, maybe you can get on TV. It's a really hard way to do it. I don't recommend it. 
But the people who come at it that way know everything about the business, which is so great and so rare, because very few people in this business actually have journalism experience. Anyway, that's my uh, life story in a nutshell. I'm going to turn it over to Margie right now, who is, if you don't know, the president of Regnery Publishing, uh, under whom in the last 12 years they have placed 52 books on the New York Times bestseller list. So she knows what she's talking about. She's got three daughters. She's on the board of Claire Booth Luce here. Uh, she's one of our campus speakers. By the way, if you don't know Claire Booth Luce, um, they prepare and promote conservative women leaders. If you want conservative women on your campus to speak, please get in touch, go to the website, uh, and they'll be happy to set you up. Quick personal note, sad day for us, Alyssa Cordova's last CPAC for a while. If you've had the pleasure, the distinct pleasure, of working with Alyssa over the past few years, you know she will be missed and loved, and we wish her well, and we hope she's back soon. Catherine, Margie, come on up. I'll, I'll let you rest for a minute. All right. <laughs> As I said, I am Margie Ross. I run Regnery Publishing. We are the um, premier leading, I would say, conservative book publisher in the country. We publish most of the um, conservative authors you love, I hope, except for Essie. Okay. Working on that. Um, but we published Ann Coulter's first book. We published Laura Ingram, Michelle Malkin, David Limbaugh, Dinesh D'Souza, Newt Gingrich, Mitt Romney, the list goes on and on and on. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to be um, the president of that organization and a little bit about what we do and how that might apply to you. Um, I uh, got an English degree from Dartmouth. I got a master's in journalism from American University. I worked on the school paper too. I think that's probably one of the best training you can have for anything you do. It teaches you how to write fast, how to edit in your head, um, and how to meet deadlines. Those are three things that are going to be valuable in any walk of life, um, which I constantly tell my daughters, and who are, by the way, very happy that I have lots of other people to give advice to, so that I stop giving it to them. Um, but um, after I graduated from um, grad school, I had a master's in journalism, and I went to work. I did a little bit of that, <coughs> that working at a little place for no pay. Um, but, um, but I always liked the editing track more than the writing track myself. So I worked as an editor uh, for the Washington Business Journal. I worked as an editor for a, um, an association in DC. And then I got um, my first really good job, which was working as an editor of newsletters that gave financial and investment advice. And um, when I was in grad school, what I really wanted to do was go well, work for the Wall Street Journal. I really liked business, finance, investment, um, journalism. So all of these things were sort of kind of hopefully leading to being, you know, a business editor at the Wall Street Journal. See how that worked out. I, um, I ended up um, sort of going through the conservative door, going through the financial conservative door into the conservative movement. And um, I was you know, only about 25 years old when I got that job, and so I really was not very political, and I didn't know a lot about what I even believed. But by working for, um, uh, with some of these gurus who gave investment advice, I came to realize that actually the only thing that made sense was fiscal conservatism. And so that's how I ended up um, becoming part of the conservative movement and um, really just took every opportunity that I had in, uh, in that job as an editor and then a publisher and then a group publisher. And, um, and, and my advice there is really very simple, which is not only take every opportunity you have, but truly work really hard at everything you do. Start every job well and leave every job well. One of the easiest things to do is to look forward to the next job and think, oh, I am so excited about the next job, and forget to do an incredibly good job in the last two weeks of whatever job you're leaving. Um, that's one of the most valuable things you can do, leave a job well, because it's a very small community, a small town, and everyone knows everyone, and you can be pretty sure that at whatever job you get, you will be working with 
people that you've worked with before, people come back around, circulate, you'll be working for, or someone will be working for you, that you met and worked with in another job. So that was something that was very valuable to me along the way. And, um, and then I got an opportunity to go work for Regnery as the general manager because I had developed this ability to sort of run publishing groups. And I was an English major. I literally never took a business or economics course in my life. But a lot of it was common sense, and a lot of it was just working hard and learning while you were doing. So I became um, <coughs> I was a group publisher, moved over to be a general manager at Regnery, and then when Al Regnery, whose father started the company in 1947, and who had taken over when his father retired in 1986, when he was ready to retire, in um, 2003, I, I got this job, so I took over as the president and publisher of Regnery. I get to work with an amazing uh, list of people, really smart people, really interesting people, sometimes scary people, um, <laughs> and um, too much honesty. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I learn something from every single author I work with, and that's a wonderful opportunity. That's, I think, something that is one of the most fun things about being in journalism and writing and publishing, is that you meet so many interesting people and you get to learn about so many things. Um, you know, as he was talking about being a generalist, and um, in, in a lot of jobs that we do in publishing, you do have to be a generalist, but our um, secret to success, or a big part of our success, is being very focused. So for Regnery, we are, a conservative political book publisher. That puts us pretty, you know, pretty clearly in one niche. And frankly, after you do something for a long time as you're doing the same thing, you really ought to be getting good at it, getting better at it. And that's what's been true for Regnery for some time. You know, the more we've done the same thing, the better we get at it. And the more people know us, the more our brand has grown. And um, and so when we're looking for an author, we are looking for somebody who's an expert. It is true that if you are a pundit, you can know a little bit about a lot of things. I actually know a little bit about a lot of things because I have to publish a lot of different books and work with a lot of different authors. But for an author on a book, you do need that depth. You do need to have um, a depth of knowledge in one particular area. The trick really is, and we'll talk about this when we break up into groups, but I think the trick is to start in a pretty focused area and then add on sort of contiguous areas of interest. So as you broaden your base of knowledge, you become an expert in a growing range of things, and then you are the person that Fox News or GBTV or whomever um, NRO wants to call and have you on, have you, have you ready for that. So, um, so I will talk uh, when we break up a little bit more about you know, what it takes to be successful as a book author, <coughs> what publishers are looking for when they um, vet proposals, when they come up with ideas for books, um, how to get an agent, um, how to work with a publisher successfully, and um, just some sort of things that Regnery looks for um, when we're saying, is this person going to be a successful author for us? Um, and there are a number of, of things that, uh, that I'll talk about in detail when we break up. But probably just um, before I hand it over, I will say um, the biggest thing that we look for in any book we publish is, and some of you have heard me say this before, it's really important question to ask, I think. I think it's a question every single writer should ask. We always say, when we get a book proposal, I'll say to the author, who is this for and why do they care? And if you are able to have a really good answer to who is this for and why do they, they care, you have a pretty good chance of having a good book idea, a good article idea, a good column idea, a good whatever, because you're thinking about it from the marketplace point of view. And I think that's a big key to Regnery's success, that's a big key to my success, and most of the successful writers and authors I know are thinking about not the beautiful words of the page, but they're thinking about the reader. They're thinking about who's reading this, 
What are the questions that are popping up in their mind? What kind of a language are they comfortable? What references will they get and what will they not get? Um, all the things that make sure that you are building rapport with the person, hopefully, who's reading or listening to what you have to say. So I think um, if the more specific you can get in that answer, the better. Um, the worst possible answer to the question, who is this for? Um, and I get this. Um, everybody! <laughs> I think my book is for everybody! <laughs> I love that answer. This is the worst possible answer. Um, because no book is for everybody. And, um, and, and to me, it betrays a, um, a lack of uh, maybe understanding or maybe just attention to thinking through what that question really means and what you're writing and who really is going to be reading it. Um, a lot of times I think about our markets in concentric circles. So m the most important thing is to focus on the bullseye of your marketplace. Perfect <coughs> person. Who is the <coughs> easiest person to convince that they should care about what you have to say? And then sort of move out from there as you get broader and broader. That's how books become successful. They start by hitting right in the center of the target. And then as more and more people hear about it, more and more people think about why it's important to broaden out to sell, hopefully, um, hundreds of thousands of books. Um, so I'll just end with a couple scary statistics. Um, there are over 300,000 new titles published every year. Way too many books. More books than, you know, many, many generations could read in each of their lifetimes. Um, so that means it's really competitive. Um, and that's, those are the books that are published. That's not even beginning to scratch the surface of all the people who write or propose to write something that never even gets published. Um, so it's a very, very concer uh, competitive uh, marketplace and landscape. And um, the other statistic <coughs> is that 90% uh, of the hardcover books that are published <coughs> sell fewer than 5,000 copies. So way too many books not enough readers. Um, it's, uh, it's challenging, it's competitive, it's a lot of fun, it's very exciting, it's important. Um, and so when we meet, I'll try to give you some advice on how to uh, be successful. Thanks. So much. Great, thank you for that. And just briefly, this is Catherine, she's here. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, she's the editor of NRO National Review Online. She's also a Claire Booth Lewis campus speaker. Um, yes. The last time I was um, with Essie, we were in St. Thomas. Yes. Don't even. <laughs> uh, and I wrote for National Review Cruise. 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 Mm -hmm. um, which I got seasick. Yeah. Well, yeah, everybody <laughs> did. <laughs> that was a particularly rough, uh, rough, rough ride there. Um, <laughs> the NR cruise is like a floating CPAP. I think you'll yes. you'll attest uh, yeah. without the Occupy protesters. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, I'm editor at large at, at National Review Online, and I, I need to revise and extend my Joe Wilson like shout out before um, when I said too much honesty about scary <laughs> scary people we we may room. Work with. There's no such thing as too much honesty, of course. Um, but um, but uh, there are lots of fascinating characters that we work with. I, um, unlike Margie, I always loved politics. I was some four, I think I was a four-year-old dork watching Peter Jennings and listening to, to I would be listening to Ron. I actually distinctly remember we were about to invade Tripoli and I was supposed to be asleep and I had like a radio underneath my pillow <laughs> so my parents wouldn't catch me um, listening to President Reagan. But anyhow, um, all, all types, right? And you can get a job. <laughs> so uh, I, I grew up in New York City, Manhattan, hotbed of conservatism. <laughs> and uh, and uh, even before Rudy Giuliani was mayor, so it re really was a hotbed of conservatism. Um, I say sarcastically at first. Um, I, um, I went to Catholic University as, uh, in Washington, D.C. here, because I wanted to go to school in Washington, and I, I also uh, am interested, and it's carried over, and it helps when we have fights over religious liberty and things. I, I was interested in Catholic issues and Catholic identity and what that means. 
And um, I had already, when I was in high school, I had already done the, the newspaper thing. And that really, um, Margie, and because I showed up late, Essie may have, may have said this too, having such a rich uh, uh, newspaper history and all. That, that is the best way. If you, if you want to communicate ideas in life, and you don't have to be a pundit or an editor or a writer or um, just communicate in the workplace, learning how to write and communicate different things and, and make phone calls and ask questions are just about the best skills that you can have. So, so even if you don't plan or you know, if, you're, if you're in college now and you don't, you don't plan necessarily, I assume you do because you're in this room getting into to some kind of line of political commentary uh, kind of work, it, it, it's just a great way to work on a skill set. Um, because as, as, um, as was also mentioned before, um, practice, right? <laughs> That's how you get successful, you get better at something. And so just writing um, is, is, is very helpful um, for, for all things, but especially, especially this line of thing. So, I, so when I was in college, I, I was politically active on campus um, on actually some, some Catholic identity issues. Um, and, um, and I also, uh, which taught me to, to, to figure out very quickly, which is sort of key, who, who exactly you are and what you believe in, and if you actually believe in these things enough to fight for them in, in sometimes hostile territory and in odd, odd debates that come up um, where you really, really have to think through things. And I, I wrote for a paper, uh, the college paper, and at some point the law school paper, and but I did a lot of writing, which has carried over too. You just write for for lots of different outlets when you can. Um, I actually then, while I was in school, I was interning. One of the benefits of being in Washington in school is, of course, to intern, especially during the fall, the fall and spring semesters, internship school war. And and while while lots of kids come to. Uh, Washington for the summer, of course. During during the uh, school year, sometimes people are desperate for interns. I just I just picked up an intern from from uh, Catholic U the other day because we sort of are desperate for interns, and and there there are always the students who are interested in, in, in new experiences. I um I actually never recommend to people while while I while I take intern interns. I don't recommend overloading your schedule with that kind of thing because one of one of my regrets anyway was that when I was in college I was super active on campus and in other things and I sort of I got to the point in my last semester where I was taking these unbelievable classes with like world experts on philosophy and and I, I was sort of doing it half time, so I wasn't the best student by the time by the end of, and I, which was ironic because I sort of loved that I loved being a student, but but I didn't give myself enough time to be a student. So I highly recommend taking advantage of of that opportunity because later in life you're going to have to work. You won't be able to sit down and and think through things and big issues and and write and and, and think and read read um, and and. No offense to books that came out this year, but books that didn't come out this year. <laughs> um, yeah, or exactly, or the last century. Um, it, it is remarkable. I can't, I can't keep up with all the books that Red Green and everybody else publishes. Um, and then, of course, there's well, I when when I came, when I came in and and Essie said that Marge, Margie could go first. She said, so I could rest. No, so I could tweet because we have to tweet. <laughs> I was tweeting. Um, so there are so which brings me to a little bit about my job and my world and there are so many new ways to communicate, different ways to communicate, and I still don't understand what Tumblr is. So you you, you all are ahead of me, I'm sure. Um, but that that's always I, I would hasten I, I, I think I, I can say always been the case. When National Review was founded, we were fortnightly, as they say. Not a word that people tweet about a lot, I think. Um, but uh, but uh, there came a point in, I believe, the early 70s where there were, the, p people had the sense internally that we really needed something in that week between. And so there was, there was a newsletter that went out. And um, so that was sort of, you could say that was the first blog or tweet. Um, then in the 90s, 97-ish, no, actually, if I rewind a little bit more, I forget the exact year now. Um, the Heritage Foundation and National Review uh, 
founded Town Hall together. What is now Town Hall was then just National Review and the, and the Heritage Foundation. And it was sort of a clearinghouse for conservative groups. So basically every, every, uh, every group that's here at CPAC that existed back then was probably on townhall.com. Um, and then National Review eventually had more of its own website, but it was still, it was still sort of um, <clears throat> where, where you went to find out the address so you can subscribe and put a, you put a stamp on, and you, know, you wouldn't subscribe obviously through there. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because back then we were looking for, we, we, we slowly started to use that, that, uh, that outlet to get conservative ideas out, which is what we're in the business of. We obviously are conservative and we don't pretend not to be and, and we're part of a movement. Um, we do reporting also as well, but we don't pretend that, that it's not coming from a particular world view. So, so around, um, Around 90, 98, when we were uh, <coughs> impeaching Bill Clinton, um, people were people were looking for lots of updates, and and we hired. Um, a, 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 first of all, I should say I started at National Review 15 years ago this March, so I was um, 97. I started at National Review, and um, and uh, we hired in 1998, uh, or maybe it was late 97, Jonah Goldberg, who I'm sure you all know. Um, who has another book coming out in uh, May, I believe. Um, Tyranny of the Clichés, I think. I'm sure a lot of you um, have read his liberal fascism. I would suggest reading it if you haven't. It's a great book. But so jo Jonah Goldberg um, came on then, and he, of course, was close to the whole Clinton uh, Clinton uh, escapades because his 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 mother had advised Linda Tripp, and I won't go all, all into that. But anyway, it was... That was sort of the launch of the start of, of National Review Online, which is where I spent a lot of my time um, during, during the course of my time. And then a time at National Review, and, and, and when we had the, uh, the post-election fight, Bush, Bush v. Gore, that was really the moment when NRO really, really became this, this place where we had breaking updates. And, and now if you go to National Review Online, there's sort of too much to read because there are so many experts and so many so many different approaches to getting those conservative ideas out. To just rewind about me for a second, I um, started National Review answering the phones, and um, and I I uh, I was still in school. It was my last semester of school actually, and uh, and I'm just happy to answer phones at National Review. Somebody needs to answer phones at National Review, and and um, you know I did all that diligently. And uh, John O'Sullivan was our editor, editor at the time, and he'd always hear me on the other end of the, the phone. And one day he said, "Why don't you write a, a paragraph for our editorial paragraph for the week on uh, our editorial section in the in the magazine? I think it was on the Violence Against Women's Act at the time." And that was that was the start of, of writing for National Review. I think at the time, the first things that I wrote at National Review wound up on the website, which was not a cool thing at the time. It was actually like where we put stuff that didn't fit in the magazine. So, but you still got published. And then we obviously saw, actually that can be a cool thing. That doesn't have to be the leftovers or the not quite ready for prime time uh, <laughs> outlet. I, um, I, I, Rich Lowry became editor of National Review in, uh, uh, I don't remember the year now. I think it was a, it was. It must have been around '98, and it was '98. And I, I had been in Washington. We, we, as he was, he was national political reporter at the time, reporting on on Washington politics. Went back to to New York, um, where I'm from, and to our main office because we, our main office is in New York. National Review has always been based in New York, um, and uh, and I'm, 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 I was just told. To, you round it up, so I just want to see if there's anything else. I want to say, point, point of that whole story I was just going to tell is that I have done every job at National Review. I laid at the magazine, I, I've made coffee over the years, but, but whenever there's, and I've always shown a willingness to do whatever we need to do done, which is a skill that is helpful, or an attitude that's very helpful to have in sort of a team. Um, so, so I'll talk more. Um, it, as we break up about about other uh, other useful skills, but I think Rick stands warm here without making any endorsements or trying to convince anybody of a candidate. I think is a great great example of 
just sort of a basic truth, which will carry, carry, carry you uh, to some success. Hard work pays off, and sometimes things look like they're, uh, they're not going to work out, but everybody's paying attention to them. <laughs> Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you.